We're in Psalm 71. We started this study two weeks ago. And this is such an unusual song from all of the others. And I'm so excited to share this song with you. And if you'll follow along either in your Bibles or on the screen, let's start at verse 1. I'll read the entire song for you so that it's familiar again. But I'm going to do something a little bit different today as we're reading through this. I've taken the English translations for the names of God, which usually show up as either Lord or God, and I've changed them back to the Hebrew names that the writer originally used. And so when we read, O Yahweh, we already know that that's the word Lord in English, but Yahweh is the covenant name of God. In the Old Testament, God communicated himself with different names, and all of the names reflect his character, his nature. That's what makes these names so important. It's not just Lord or God as we understand it, but he wants us to understand his nature. And so when we read, oh, Yahweh, that's the covenant relational name. I have come to you for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. Save me, rescue me, for you do what is right. Turn your ear to listen to me. Set me free. Be my rock of safety where I can always hide. Give the order to save me, for you are my rock and my refuge. Oh, my Elohim, there's the all-powerful name of God. Elohim, rescue me from the power of the wicked, from the clutches of cruel oppressors. Oh, Adonai Yahweh, relational, powerful name. You alone are my hope. I trusted in you, even from childhood. Yes, you have been with me from birth. Even from my mother's womb, you have cared for me. No wonder I am always praising you. My life has been an example to many because you have been my strength and protection. That's why I can never stop praising you. I declare your glory all day long. And now, in my old age, don't set me aside. Don't abandon me when my my strength is failing. For my enemies are whispering against me. They are plotting together to kill me. They say, even Elohim has abandoned him. Let's go and get him, for no one will help him now. Oh, Elohim, don't stay away. My Elohim, please hurry to help me. Bring disgrace and destruction on my accusers. Humiliate and shame those who want to harm me. But I will keep on hoping for your help. I will praise you more and more. I will tell everyone about your righteousness. All day long, I will proclaim your saving power. Though I'm not skilled with words, I will praise your mighty deeds. Oh, Adonai Yahweh, I will tell everyone that you alone are just. Oh, Elohim, you have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things you do. Now that I am old and gray, do not abandon me, O Elohim. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, your mighty miracles to all who come after me. Your righteousness, Elohim, reaches to the heavens. You have done such wonderful things. Who can compare with you, O Elohim? You have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore me to life again and lift me from the depths of the earth. You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort uh, and comfort me once again. Then I will praise you with music on the harp because you are faithful to your promises, O my Elohim. I will sing your praises to you with a lyre, O, O Holy One of Israel. I will shout for joy and sing your praises, for you have ransomed me. I will tell of your righteous deeds all day long, for everyone who tried to hurt me has been shamed and humiliated. The song ends there. This is such a unique song from any of the other songs that we've been looking at all the way through the first two books of Psalms. 
And I shared with you a couple weeks ago that there are some important observations about this song that make it noteworthy and important for our study. Let me just quickly share in review the three observations that make this song unique. And the first one is we really don't know who wrote it. It doesn't have a name in the title. Now, what makes it so unique is that if David wrote it, we could certainly understand, but there are some challenges to David's authorship of this, especially when he writes and says that I'm going to sing your praises, I'm going to tell others, even though I'm not skilled with words. And everyone knew that David was Israel's sweet and skilled songwriter and singer. So there's real reason to question whether David wrote it, but whether he wrote it or not, it clearly has Davidic influences. In fact, the author deliberately and word for word quotes from four psalms that David did write, Psalm 22, 31, 35, and 40. All of them are found within Psalm 71. So whoever wrote it was clearly familiar with David's songs. And whether it was David or not, the second observation that makes this song so unique is that it was a song written for old age. This one more than any. In fact, there is only one other song. There are three great poetic passages that deal with old age. Psalm 71, Psalm 92, and Ecclesiastes 12. All three of those are poetic in their description and discussion of old age. And when the writer says twice, I am old and gray, I'm in the last stage of my life, it speaks very intentionally to those of us who are either in or moving into that last great stage of our lives. It's important for us to study this. Even for those of us who are younger, to anticipate what our lives are going to be like when we get older. And then the last is that more than any other song, this is unusual. We've seen lots of songs that are laments, where David is pouring out his heart to God because of the difficulty of the circumstances. But this is recognized to be a little bit different. In fact, very different from the other laments because everything he says is a struggle in his life. He couches in a spirit of hope. As some commentators right? It's almost paradoxical to say that this is a song of lamenting hope. And yet it does. Even when we're in that last difficult stage of life, we still have a sense of absolutely underpinning hope that carries us through that period. And so as we're working through this, these are the things that make this song unique. But there are six verse divisions and themes I've shared with you the importance, and I've said it over and over. You can't appreciate Hebrew poetry without understanding Hebrew parallelism. The idea of a statement and restatement. The statement can be as much as a whole verse division, and the restatement the same, or it can happen within the verse. This is unique from every other song because the, it's more than just verse divisions, it is the whole flow of the song that represents the statement, restatement. First, you have the division of trust. Then he goes back and says in the second division, God, this is how you took care of me in the past. You have a statement that recognizes trust and how God takes care. But then in a mirror image, the restatement is now just a repetition God, I trust you, you took care of me in the past, and so I can trust you to take care of me in the future. And you have this incredible mirror image of the statement and restatement. It's a beautiful flow that represents what parallelism looks like in Hebrew poetry. But it doesn't just stop there. Then we come after seeing this flow from trust, past, care, in the future, to trust again, to the last two sections, which then reflect the climax or the enhanced parallelism. Now, because of all of this, I'm going to focus on the God who is worthy of praise in verses 19 through 21, and that's capped off by the enhanced 
finished climax of parallelism, which is in the last section of verses 22 through 24. And I have the God who is worthy of praise, and now I am going to praise, lifelong praise of the God who is worthy. There's no other song like this. It is the most incredible in terms of its flow as well as its subject matter and content. Now, I shared with you a couple weeks ago, and very quickly, the first section was David's declaration of trust in the most difficult circumstances of his life. He said, Lord, I've come to you for protection. And all of the following statements are actually short, imperative commands. Save me, rescue me, do what's right, turn your ear to listen to me, set me free, all of these things. God, I trust you to do these things for me. And then he says, God, the reason I can trust you right now to do this is because you've proven yourself to me over and over and over again throughout my past. Oh, Lord, you alone have been my hope. I've trusted in you, oh, Lord, from childhood. Yes, you have been with me even from birth. From my mother's womb, you've cared for me. And because you've done all of that throughout my entire life, no wonder I'm praising you all the time. Wow, that's why I can never stop praising you. I'm going to declare your glory all the time, all day long. And God, as you've proven yourself to me over and over by providing for covering me, for delivering me in my past, now I am calling on you to do it again in my future. As I'm moving into and I'm existing in this last stage of my life called old age. Now, in my old age, don't set me aside. Don't abandon me when my strength is failing. Folks, let's just be honest, all right? From the moment that we're born, we're all swirling the drain, all right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter how old we are. The only difference is the older we get, the closer to the center we And it feels like things are picking up and our lives are changing. Our bodies are changing. And I don't have the strength that I once had. I don't have the memory. My eyes are fading. It was Martin Luther, the great reformer, who once jokingly said, it would be a good thing if young people were wise and the old were strong. Wouldn't it be nice? And we can all certainly identify with that. Things are changing. You get to a point in, you know, at first in our 20s, 30s, and even 40s, we we think we're invincible. We can do anything. We can, we're the fixer. We can win every battle. Then start things start slowing down, you get into your 50s, and suddenly you've got love handles, and you've got all these things that are going on, and you're starting to, oh, my, my eyes are really having more problems, and then you get into your 60s, and what do you mean I'm wearing hearing aids? What? <laughs> well, how did that happen? And things start changing. You walk into a room, and you go, why did I come in here in the first place? You know, there are some important things that the psalmist is communicating for those of us who are starting to really experience those life changes now. And Solomon was certainly familiar with this song. Solomon was a young man who loved God, who was passionately pursuing the Lord. And then all of a sudden, as he got into the prime of his life, things started changing. He started marrying women from other nations who brought other gods into his life. And he stopped pursuing. Oh, he was religious, he made sacrifices, but he stopped relationally pursuing God. He grew cold. And as a result, he became carnal in every sense of the word. And it wasn't until he was in his last stage of life only a couple years before he died, that there is a spiritual revival in Solomon's life. In fact, many people would describe Ecclesiastes as Solomon's spiritual autobiography. As he writes about the accomplishments of his life and what they mean to him at that point. And when you get to the last chapter, it's Solomon's way of challenging young people to be faithful to God 
right into their old age. In fact, he describes the aging process, and notice how he uses so many different metaphors for all the things that happen to us as we're aging. And he's writing to younger people in adulthood saying, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old. And you say, life's not so pleasant anymore. Remember God, before the light of the sun, moon, and the stars is dim in your old eyes. And now look at these Incredible descriptions of what happens to our bodies as we age. Before, the sun, moon, and stars start to dim in your old eyes. And rain clouds continually darken your sky. There's a sense of depression or fear, concern that starts to hit you. Remember, God, before your legs, the guards of your houses start to tremble. Before your shoulders, the strong men start to stoop. Remember, God, before your teeth, your few remaining servants stop grinding because they fall out. Before your eyes see dimly. Remember, God, before the door to life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Remember, God, now you rise at the first chirping of the birds. Isn't it interesting how older folks tend to get up so early and they're ready to start their day at 4.30, you know, and things change. You, you rise at the first chirping of the birds, and then all of the sounds of their chirping are faint because you can't hear like you used to. Remember, God, before you become fearful of falling and worry about the danger in the streets, we're not invincible anymore, right? Before your hair turns white like the almond tree in bloom. I never thought about my hair looking like an almond tree in bloom. Before you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper. Now that's how I want to be remembered. <laughs> There's Steve. He's a dying grasshopper. Remember, God, before you near the grave, your everlasting home, when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, remember your creator now, while you're young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. That's a poetic description of when we go crazy. All right? We lose, we lose our memory. We lose it all. It's gone. Don't wait until the water dryer is smashed. <laughs> what a picture of death, huh? There's Steve in the casket. His water jar sure broke. The pulley is broken at the well because then that's it. The dust is going to return to the earth. Spirit is going to return to God. He's saying, look, we all get older. We all age. Things change when we're older. And you have to choose and plan what you're going to be like when you get to that last stage, when it comes to your spirit, when it comes to your faithfulness to God and how you serve him. Don't wait. Don't wait. Because this is going to happen to every one of us, whether we like it or not. We can't stop the aging, dying process. It's been happening for the last 6,000 years. It's going to happen as long as we're in these bodies that are decaying. And when those life changes happen, you have to anticipate it. You have to be ready because it's not just physical changes. There are going to be physical, emotional, social, mental changes. All of life starts to change a little bit. In fact, one of the greatest of the pastors and Bible teachers that I've ever had the privilege of sitting under is Warren Wearsby. And Warren Wearsby a great Bible teacher, great pastor, great speaker. And yet, in the last stage of his life, Warren Wearsby described things that were happening to him in ways that he could not have expected. In his autobiography, Be Myself, he wrote about the relational changes that were happening in his life after retirement. He said, when I was the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Covington, Kentucky, 
Most of these people didn't even know I existed. And he's writing about all of those people who were calling him, asking him to be an author and write books, to be at a conference, to do all these things that were at the height of his career. And he said, those people, when I was just in a smaller church, they didn't know me, but when I became the pastor of Moody Church, they suddenly got interested in me. And Warren Wiersbe was invited to write books, take his sermons, and put them into a commentary series. He was invited to speak at conferences. Everybody knew of Warren Wiersbe once he became the pastor of a well-known church. And then it happened again when he left Moody and went to back to the Bible. But then he retired. And when I left back to the Bible, I slowly faded into oblivion. Warren Wiersbe is the last name in evangelicalism that I would have ever thought would describe his life as fading into oblivion. He says, I'm not complaining. That's just the way the system works. And all of a sudden, even people who have been in ministry all of their adult life find that things are changing, things are changing. Things are changing. I got to tell you the story of how all this happened. I, about five weeks ago, my best friend, Dean Madison, who is out in California as a pastor, he retired this last year. Last summer, I was at his retirement party. And about five weeks ago, Dean called me one morning and said, I got to read this to you. And he read me this quote. I said, that is so cool. Wow, what a powerful statement. And I just kind of tucked it in the back of my mind, but it was so important. And then I was having lunch with a gentleman from our church who's been involved in ministry all of his adult life. And I said, let me read this statement to you. And I read the statement to him, and he said, that's exactly what my life is like right now. I feel like I'm fading into oblivion. Wow. And then this song comes up, and we're studying Psalm 71. I, I need to share this. And so I called my pal, Dean, and I said, Dean, I want you to read that quote to me so I can write it down, and I'm going to put it in the sermon. And Dean just happened, he lives in Los Angeles, but he happened to be visiting his in-laws in Zion two weeks ago. And he says, I don't have the book with me. It's back in California. I said, oh, he says, you know, what you could do is call one of your libraries, maybe they have the book, and you'll find that quote on page 240. It's on the left-hand column halfway down. I said, wow. And I said, what's the name of the book? He says, I don't know, I don't remember. I, I, what? What? I said, wait, you just told me it's on page 240, left-hand column halfway down, you don't remember the book? title? And he said, Steve, I just retired. I'm fading into oblivion. And this spoke to me. I thought, wow, that's pretty significant. Now, what's really cool is that I happen to know Warren Wiersbe's niece, and it just happens to be Erica Krieger's grandmother. And I called her and I said, Corrine, do you have the book? And she said, yeah, I've got the book. I said, could you get the book, turn to page 240, tell me what the statement is. It's on the left-hand column halfway down. And so that's how we have the, the quote today. <laughs> but there comes a point when everything changes so dramatically that we start to feel like the world is leaving us behind. Right? And it's hard. And when we feel, we're not complaining, it's just the way the system works. The real challenge is not just what happens to us physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, but what happens when we feel this in a spiritual sense and we wonder if God has even abandoned us. 
that's what the concern in verses 10 and 11 is. When he says, my enemies are whispering against me, they say, even God has abandoned him. And he calls out, he cries out there, oh God, don't stay away. My God, please hurry and help me. You know, many of us have prayed that same prayer, called out to God, God, in this stage of my life, when everything is changing, God, I still need you. And what I love is that when God hears that prayer from his servants, he answers that prayer with a resounding yes. In in Isaiah 46, he says, yes, I want you to remember as you're moving into that last stage, I will be your God throughout your entire lifetime. Until your hair is white with age, I made you. I'm going to keep on taking care of you. And that's the tense that says it will, won't just happen once. It's going to keep on happening. God will continue to take care of you even to your last breath. I will carry you along. And there's this picture of God carrying us right up to the last breath. And he says, and I will even save you. The word save is deliver you. He says, I'm going to carry you to the last breath and I'm going to deliver you when the last breath is taken and you're going to be with me. You don't have to worry. When everything is changing, when it feels like everything is falling apart around you, God is still there. He's still your Elohim, the all-powerful God. He's still your Yahweh, the covenant God who loves you. And he says, I will be with you. I will take care of you. I will carry you in the same way that I've carried you in the past. I will carry you right up to the last breath, and you can trust me. You can trust me. And so that drives this author to say, God, thank you. God, praise you. And there are six imperative, emphatic declarations. Yes, God, because you promised to take me right up to the last breath, I'm going to keep hoping in you. I'm going to keep praising you more and more. I'm going to keep on telling everybody about your righteousness. All day long, I'm going to proclaim your saving power. Even if I'm not skilled with words, God, I'm going to let everybody know. He pushes even farther, and I'm going to praise your mighty deeds, O sovereign Lord. I'm going to tell everybody that you're just. And he's saying, God, I'm going to let everybody know about your nature, about your character. Oh, God, oh, Elohim, you have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I now still constantly tell everyone about the wonderful things that you do. Wow, there is a a sense of deliberate intentionality in the author that says, even in this last stage of my life, I am going to keep on sharing. I'm going to keep on serving. I'm going to be faithful. You know, friends, we have a phenomena that's happened in America and other European countries that you never had in the first century of Israel, of Rome, or in the 3,000 years ago when this song was written, there was no word called retirement. There simply was no word in the Hebrew language for retirement. And yet somehow we've come to believe that at a certain age, 65, 70, maybe even 75, there is a point when I'm done when I can just quit and live my life any way I want and I am going to stop being productive. And the saddest part is that not only has this impacted our work and social and mental lives, but I'm afraid that this spirit of retirement, this spirit of checking out has impacted the church so that seniors get to a certain point and they say, no, let the young people take care of it now. I don't need to do this anymore. And they just walk away. At what could be one of the most productive periods of their life from a spiritual impacting relational perspective, they say, no, I'm done. I'm done. And that is antithetical to everything, everything the psalmist is writing here. He's saying, in my old age, that's when I'm going to be the most productive. That's when I'm going to tell people, and I'm going to keep on being used. It is so interesting. I shared with you, there are three great poetic passages that deal with the aging process. Psalm 71 
Ecclesiastes 12, and then this song that was written by David, Psalm 92. It is one of my absolute favorites. You have no idea how many times I've quoted this psalm at funerals of faithful believers. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to the Most High. It is good to proclaim your unfailing love in the morning, your faithfulness in the evening. Oh, God, oh, Lord, oh, Yahweh, you thrill me with all that you've done for me. Oh, I love this word. Look, all right, let's pause for a second. That verse four, you thrill me, Lord. The relational parallel to this is when you see a couple who after they've been married for 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50 years, and they still love being together. I see couples all the time, and you can tell the difference. When a couple comes in and, you know, they're at that stage, they've been together for 30, 40, 50 years, and they're just kind of coexisting. Oh, we like each other, but we're more roommates than anything else. And then you can see the ones who are still excited who still love to be there. It's not agape love. It's phileo. It's the emotional, relational interaction. And you can see they're holding hands when they come in. And it's not just to keep the other one from falling, all right? It's they, oh, they, and you see them are interacting with each other. And at 65, 70, 80 years old, the guy's still giving his wife a little pat, you know? And you just, whoa, and he says, he looks at her, and he says, you know what? At 75 years old, you still take my breath away. You still thrill me. That's what is communicated in this verse 4. God, after 50, 60, 70, 80 years of being with you, you still thrill me. I still get excited about my time with you. It's not agape. It is phileo relationship. It is that desire that just can't be quenched. And you say, oh, God, I am so excited to be with you. You thrill me because of everything you are, because of everything that you do. I sing for joy when I think about you. Man, that's the way I want to go out. I want to go out being just as excited about God today as I was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Oh, Lord. Oh, you are amazing. Oh, Lord. What great works you do, Psalm 92 says. How deep are your thoughts? Yes, Lord, you will be exalted forever. And then it moves to the issue of the old age. The godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. Wait a minute. All that growth that usually happens happens in our 20s and 30s and starts to coast a little bit in the 40s. But he's saying the godly, the old people, can get stronger. The old people can have an impact. The godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. Not fade, not coast. They are planted in the Lord's own house and they will flourish in the courts of our God. Notice verse 14. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital. And one translation says fresh and green. We've reached a point in our culture and in the culture of the church where old people think it's okay to coast. Just, I'm going to coast into heaven. I don't have to stay involved. I don't have to do all that stuff that happened 20, 30 years ago. And yet God is saying to you, listen, understand this. My plan for your life was never that you would just coast into heaven. Nate Saint, the great missionary who died in 1956 along with Jim Elliott and the others in Ecuador said before he died, I would rather die right now than to live a life of oblivious ease. I don't want to fade into oblivion. I want my days, no matter if it's short or long, to always be vital, fresh, and green. I want to have an impact. 
Adoniram Johnson was a great missionary to Burma who was faithful to God as a missionary until he died. And he wrote one time and said, the motto of every Christian, the mission statement of every Christian, whether preacher, printer, schoolmaster, plumber, electrician, mechanic, it doesn't matter what we do, housewife, our mission statement should be devoted for life. Devoted for life. There's never a moment where we just decide, I'm going to sit back and say, okay, now I've done enough, I'm going to coast. John Wesley was one of the greatest evangelists and Bible teachers of his day, and probably of the entire world. I mean, he's had such an impact. His ministry spanned from England to Ireland to America. He started the Methodist denomination. Great Bible teacher. Went out on horseback year after year after year, every day preaching somewhere. He lived until he was 88 years old. And he kept a diary almost every day of his adult life. I want to share the entry that he wrote on his 86th birthday when he said this day, and it was on Sunday the 28th of 1789, he said, this day I enter my 86th year. Now I find I'm growing old. (laughs) 86, he's starting to grow old. And he said, my sight is decayed so that I can't read a small print unless I have a strong light. Good grief. At 64, my sight is gone. I can't read small print whether I have light or not. My strength is decayed so that I walk much slower than I did some years since. My memory of names, whether of persons or places, is decayed until I stop a little to recollect them. Man, I can't remember names at all. That's why we have name tag Sundays here, you know? Because I forget all the time, and it doesn't matter how much time I spend, I got to look it up or I'm not going to get it back. And maybe you're in that same place. He pushes a little farther and he said, those things are concerning, my sight, my ability to walk, my memory, but what I'm really concerned about, what I should really be afraid of, is that if I I'm thinking about tomorrow, if I take thought for the morrow, that my body with all of its physical ailments and concerns would start to weigh down my mind and create one of two conditions. Because of my physical ailments, I don't want to suddenly become stubborn by the decrees of my understanding. And as much as I don't want to be stubborn, I don't want to be peevish. And the word peevish is an old word that we now use the word ornery. I don't want to become ornery, cantankerous, just because I'm getting old. But God, you're going to have to take care of that. But thou shalt answer for me, O Lord my God. If we were to take this, what he said, and put it in the vernacular with this study, he's simply saying, Lord... Don't let the condition of my body, my age, determine the condition of my spirit. Now, it doesn't mean that life is going to be easy. In fact, in verse 20, it is emphatic when the writer says, you've allowed me to suffer much hardship. Our lives are going to be filled with challenge. Job said that man is born to trouble as smoke rises from a fire. But there's a challenge for us, especially those of us who are seniors or moving into that last stage. The writer is saying to everyone, not only consider what you'll be like when you get there, but as you're entering into this stage, here's the great challenge. Stay involved. Stay involved. What does that look like in our lives? Stay involved. First, it means don't stop attending church. Don't stop meeting together with other believers and being part of the body and life of the church. Oh, look, I'm going to move from preaching to meddling real quick here. But what's happened in this last year is one of the most unusual social cultural phenomena that we've ever seen. None of us have seen anything like it in our lifetimes. Because of the pandemic, people were locked in their homes for over a year. Last night, we had a couple who was here for the first time in a year and a half. This morning, I just talked with somebody, first time in a year that they've been able to be back. I know that this has been a difficult year, and I know that there are still people who are watching online 
who don't feel safe coming out because of health issues. I get that. But what's also happened over this last year that none of us have ever seen in our life is that because of technology, we've been able to start watching online. And as much as there are some people who are watching online out of necessity, there are some who are watching right now who are watching out of laziness. It's been comfortable to watch online. And I think I'm just going to keep on watching online. Then we don't have to get dressed up and go somewhere. And we like just watching the services instead of being part of it. And that was never God's plan. Never God's plan for technology to replace the body life of the church. And the great challenge for seniors is while you have life and strength, while you can do this, yes, there may be a point where it's physically impossible, but while you have life and strength to stay involved in the body and life of the church, there is nothing that is more fulfilling and exciting for me than to see multi-generations of families sitting together in church. And when parents, when grandparents say, oh, I'm just going to watch online, they stop being an example and a testimony to their children their grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren. And I want to encourage you, don't coast. Don't coast. Stay connected. And as much as you're here, be a part of small groups and Bible studies. Here's the challenge that we have in the church today. We've pocketed everybody by generations. Okay, we'll have a seniors Bible study. We'll have a young family Bible study. We'll have men and women's groups. And very rarely do we say, we're going to mix them up so that the seniors have an influence and are able to talk to people who are younger. We think that they're no longer relevant. And that is the most opposite and contrary thing to all of Scripture. Remember, it is the godly and the wise who have experience of years who have something to teach younger men. Women who are older, who are able to teach younger women how to love their husbands and to be great homekeepers and the rest. And yet somehow we think it's okay just to separate everybody else. The next challenge of being involved is help with the children's ministries. Oh, no, you're asking me to do nursery duty. No, I'm saying you can make a difference. Make a difference in young kids' life. Can I share a personal example of how this made? When Krista and I were in Aurora, my parents lived in Zion. Her parents lived in Milwaukee. Our kids never saw their grandparents. Never. And there was an older couple who lived three doors down named the Hughes who said, we'll be surrogate grandparents for your kids. And every day after school, Joel was walking down the sidewalk to go see Mrs. Hughes and play checkers and get donuts, which he knew we wouldn't give him. And so <laughs> it was great. They became the grandparents for our kids. And when schools had grandparents' days, they were the ones who were always there. Even when we moved here and the kids were at Lansing Christian, there was a grandparents' day and Mr. and Mrs. Hughes drew, drove from Aurora just to be here with our kids. That was so powerful. And there are kids who are going to be here in the Vacation Bible School, kids who are in our powerhouse program who don't have a father influence in their life, who don't have grandparent influences in their life. And they need the loving, understanding ear and the care that comes from older people. Don't Run from it. In fact, it's so interesting. Many of you are familiar with the Gospel Coalition, famous evangelical organization in the country here. And almost every day they send out a newsletter with different articles. This weekend, yesterday, the lead article on their blog and newsletter was Christians need more intergenerational friendships. We need more, not less. This has been such a challenge to me over the last several months that I've decided in September I'm going to start teaching a Bible study for young guys in their 20s. I'm going to take eight or ten guys, 
put them together in a 12-week series, and we're going to go from September to December. Then I'm going to do another group from January to March. Because, not because I'm old, <laughs> but because I'm older than they are. All right? Look, here's the challenge. Now that I'm old and gray, God, don't abandon me. That's one side. But God, now that I'm old and gray, let me proclaim your power to this new generation. How are they going to know if you and I don't tell them? How are they going to understand the examples of faithfulness if you and I aren't going to be a part of their lives? We want to tell God's mighty miracles to all who are coming after us. And I want to challenge you. If this message does anything to you who are seniors, if it does anything to you who are still in middle age, I want to challenge you to find a way to get involved. Thank you for those who are going to be a part of VBS. Thank you for those who are involved in Powerhouse. There are still opportunities. Folks, don't coast into heaven. Don't coast into heaven. As one pastor has so insightfully put it, as he's talking about how that he wants to approach heaven. He said, life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in an attractive and well-preserved body. But rather, life should be a slide in sideways, chocolate in one hand, badly, thoroughly used up, totally worn out and screaming, woohoo, what a ride, man. That's the way I want to get to heaven, don't you? Seriously. That's my challenge to you. And when you come to that point where you say, okay, God, that's, that's the kind of impact I want to have. You start to see life and God from a bigger perspective, and that's how the song ends. He says, oh, God, you are worthy of praise. You who have taken care of me in my childhood, in my middle years, in old age. Your righteousness, oh God, reaches to the highest heavens. You have done such wonderful things. Who can compare with you? And because you are so amazing and so great, now I am going to praise the God who is worthy. I will praise you with music on the heart. Because you're faithful to your promises, oh my God, I am going to sing to you with a lyre, oh holy one of Israel. Now, if you're not familiar with the ancient Hebrew instruments, we all understand what a harp is, but a lyre might be a little unfamiliar to you. The modern translation and name for a lyre is bass guitar, all right? I'm just, <laughs> just saying, God's favorite instrument is the bass guitar, all right? And he says, God, playing my bass guitar or whatever else you have. I am going to shout for joy, sing your praises, and I am going to tell about your righteous deeds all day long, all day long. Friends, let me challenge you. Don't coast into heaven. Don't coast. Go in on a slide, chocolate in your hand, yelling woohoo, and you are totally burned out, but that's okay. You'll have all eternity to rest, okay? Someday, someday, I want to stand before God, and I want you to stand before God. And even into your senior years, I want God to be able to look at every one of us and say, well done, well done, good and faithful servant, well done, amen? Let's pray. Father.